Let's take a little time to reveal The prehistoric stories that the earth once concealed Mix them all together on this ancient land It's time to spread some paleo jam Welcome to another episode of Paleo Jam. I'm your host, Michael Mills, and I'm at the University of New England in the NCW Beetle Herbarium in Armada here on Anawan Country. In this episode, we're going to talk about the evolution of plants, why plants are awesome, with Herbarium Director and Lecturer in Plant Systematics, uh, Dr. Andrew Thornhill. Hi, Andrew. Hello, Michael. Um, I nearly said plant semantics, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> which I suppose is a you study in it itself. Out, no, 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 we don't edit <laughs> these things, so that'll just go out there. Um, okay, so to begin with, in coming into what's the, the, the herbarium, we couldn't bring in... Our bags. Our bags anything. and things. Anything. Why? I mean, what's the herbarium and why can't couldn't I bring in like pieces of paper and stuff? So we're in... Sort of air control, quarantine controlled area where we try and reduce the amount of pest damage that would cause the collections that we have here. Okay, so so, so the, what are the collections that are here? Because the there's a lot of stuff. We we um, f- for the listeners' benefit, we you, you took me for a little walk earlier. Yeah, and there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of files of what of pressed plant materials that have been collected over the last oh, hundred or so years. The oldest one we have here is from 1853, I think, which is a Leichhardt collection. Okay, and these are these are these are plants where naturalists, botanists, whoever has gone out, snipped a bit off a tree or a plant, um, bought it back, catalogued it. Yep, recorded where they got it from. Recorded where kept all Day of that of information. Year. So sim- I'm I'm doing some work at the moment on on studying Alfred Wallace and he was a collector of great things and on one of over I think eight years in the Malay archipelago they brought back 125,000 specimens so yep which is more than what we have here so imagine what that looked like yeah so but but it's that sort of thing so you're you're getting a collection of of all the stuff so the collection here is it things that are just local to New England Mostly. Armadale. So, yeah, mostly, but some of the things that our previous botanists have specialised in, we have representatives from all around the world. So, Jeremy Brule, who was the person before me, works on Cyperaceae and Juncaceae, which are graminoid, swampy, grass-like plants. He grass-like has, plants. I understood yeah, that bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he has collections from all around the world, from not only his field trips... But when colleagues find something that they think he might be interested in, they all collect one for them and send one to us. And so okay. that's that wall that I showed you, which we're sitting in front of, that yep. sometimes we have more than what we need. So we then send it to and other then you send herbaria. it back to other places. Yep. So it's like having more than one book. And it's also an insurance policy that if something hopefully never happens here again, because we've already burnt down once before, yep. then if something, if we burnt down we'd have backups around the world that they could send to us to start okay. the herbarium again. So so if I was a botanist and I was out collecting, you know, and I was in the jungle in Borneo and I use that because I've been there and I'm snipping a few bits and I've gone and I've gone, Oh, that's one for me. Oh, I reckon Andrew at University of New England, he's really interested in this stuff. I'll get a copy for him and then I send it to you yep. and then it just adds to the yeah. bazillion And that's what happens here. We get things sent to us because I know Jeremy's into some, into one group and Ian um, Telford, our honorary curator, is into another group. And it helps build up that knowledge because you have specialists. You can't have specialists in every herbarium, but you might have someone who works on that particular group in a herbarium in that part of the world. And everyone knows they work on it, so they send it to them. So the collection becomes, to some degree particularly in that context of things that are being sent from overseas, becomes something that's a reflection of the individuals in the position. Yeah. So people that know that you're here now will go, oh, Thornhill's interested in this and this and this. In moss. And in so moss. I've already been sent 100 moss from Queensland. <laughs> and that's how the collection gets built up without me having to go on the field trip. Someone else has already done it. The reason I laugh there, listener, is that uh, there, there is a bit of a moss story between us, isn't yeah. there, Andrew? So um, in, in Adelaide, South Australia, where, where you 
worked yeah, for the last three years until I moved here at the start the of the Adelaide Botanic Garden. We were having a chat one day and I said, oh, there's this really cool page, this Facebook page about moss collectors and moss people that appreciate moss. And Andrew didn't know about it, so Andrew joined it and then Andrew has become known as the Mossiah. So people will post yeah, pictures well, as Jules might argue about that, but Well yes. So I'm so the unofficial Messiah. But, but it's it, it it's it it's interesting because it shows you that that pe- people are constantly sending in their, and I've done it. People are constantly sending in their photos of moss that they find from particular places, yeah. wherever they are. And and as you were talking about people sending in their specimens, it's a kind of similar thing, isn't well, it? What happens with yeah, people send photos to the herbarium, or I, when I went on Gardening Australia at the start of the year, people saw that story and started sending me moss photos to identify whatever they had in their garden or. <laughs> is it, and this is all my fault for introducing yeah. you to the uh, well, yes. I'm a minor moss celebrity thanks to Michael Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome <laughs> okay so we, we know what a herbarium is so it, it, but it, it's not a collector of fossils is it uh, or some, is it sometimes well we don't have many fossils in here that I know about yet we may I have which is which again it's interesting we, we were talking well, we'll come back to it in a second there are things that you are finding and, and, and old books and things yeah. that you're finding that that are in cupboards yeah, well, and things um, and nooks and if crannies you, if you could see where we're sitting things are buried on top of things because we've run out of space a little bit and a lot of herbaria are still databasing their collections because most of these collections were made pre-computers so they wrote it down if they if you were lucky they wrote it down in a book or kept it maybe on a pre like a Floppy disk or a, a hard floppy disk. Ah, those things. Yeah. Yes. That was my first USB stick. Was a just one of those hard floppy disks I used to carry in my pocket all the time. But yeah, yeah. Um, if you're lucky, you've got a database of what you have. If you don't, then it's like a doing a, a scav hunt all over again, like an archaeological dig. Sometimes I was showing Michael some of the old newspapers that we have. Which happened to be the advertiser from Adelaide. From Adelaide. From the and 60s. You, yeah, and it's that rabbit hole thing, isn't it? So you wonder sometimes how research takes so long. It's like, well, if you've wrapped things in newspapers that are 50 or 60 or 70 years old, you're unwrapping the thing and you're seeing the specimen that's in there. Yeah. But you're also seeing the stories from the yeah. newspaper. And they were, it was just... And it was like that in Adelaide as well, that I was finding moss collections made during the Second World War. And the stories about the Second World War were more interesting than the... Than the moss. Than the collections. Don't tell the people in the group that. Um, so, okay, okay. We, we, we might... I'm sure we'll come back to moss at some point during the conversation. Um, Did I touch on, on what a herbarium... The main use of the herbarium yeah, is, though? Yeah, come so back to that, yes. The main purpose of a herbarium is to document the flora of wherever you are. So every state in Australia has a state herbarium. And they are in charge of making the census of the plants that are in that state. So we're different because we're a university herbarium. So we're more focused on teaching students how to use a herbarium plus the research that the botanists previous to me and also me work on. So there's a there's a so in Adelaide the it's the Adelaide the State Garden, Herbarium State, of South Australia State yeah, Herbarium, which is where I used to work in the so, old tram barn. Yep. So the the Sydney one or the the New South Wales one. This isn't the New South Wales Herbarium. No, no. This is so the university. New, New South Wales itself has about five or six different herbaria. The big state herbarium, which is called the National Herbarium of New South Wales, same with Victoria. Figure that out. The National Herbarium. Which, of I don't Victoria. want to start a fight, but the Australian Museum is based in Sydney, not the. But anyway, Indeed. spoken like a true Victorian. Of course, of course. <laughs> this so is South Australian the, podcast, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it's podcasts are everywhere. But anyway, so, the big New South Wales herbarium was the original herbarium in Australia, started in the 1800s, was based in the Sydney Botanic Gardens. About three or four years ago, they built a whole new herbarium to house their collection, but it's now at Mount Annan, which is on the outskirts of Sydney. They have about 1.5 million collections of plants. Then you also have Sydney University that has a herbarium, UNSW has a herbarium, Macquarie, University of Wollongong, and us. But we, because of the botanists that were before me, are the ninth biggest herbarium in Australia. So we have about 110,000 collections, which is pretty big for a place where you only have one or two people collecting the whole time. It's a, it's, it's a pretty, pretty significant collection, isn't it? Um, all right. We... We don't always see the critters that live in our gardens, the animals, but we always see the plants, yeah. don't we? And 
and we we forget sometimes how important plants are because they don't make nice chirpy kookaburra sounds and things they just kind of they just make like oxygen that we breathe they just make nice oxygen that we breathe and do all kinds and food of that we eat but apart from things. that but apart from that um so i i want to i want to now for the for the remainder uh, of the podcast is is go on a little journey i guess and and talk us through because we haven't done a paleo botany podcast yet much to 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 my great regret and sorrow <laughs> and I apologize for pre- profusely for it's taken till season two, but at least I came to Armadale to, to chat with you. So, so key points in plant evolution, because everybody knows, well, not everybody, but lots of people know about, you know, the dinosaurs turned up, that then they went extinct, then there was megafauna and stuff in terms of, 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 animal evolution you know the people talk about the cambrian explosion with the lots of animals and stuff but but plants are are a lot older and have a much longer story to tell so if we're going to begin where do we begin in terms of telling the story so you'd start in the water with the algae and then the algae turn into the first land plants they evolve to grow on rocks and adapt to not having to live in a pure water environment so they start using carbon to make the oxygen and then start making oxygen how old are the oldest dinosaurs just excuse my ignorance so <laughs> so yeah so uh, there's a dinosaur eo raptor that is around about 230 million okay. years old so million million years old. we think the oldest plants based on fossils as well are about 470 million years old and they would have been moss like or maybe liverwort-like, or hornwort-like. Those three lineages aren't relatable. They're the first lineages that diverge from And that's, that's land plants. Yeah, land plants. Yeah. So technically, there's also green algae, and that is a land plant too, but that's not what we consider a land plant, land plant. Yeah. Because we're so, confusing that but, way. But, but, but with, 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 with algae, yeah. uh, blue-green algae yeah, yeah. and stuff, but that's... That's a that's whole other old. lineage. That's a whole other yeah, yeah. lineage. And that's, we're talking... Oh, don't even know, yeah. Well, maybe not billions, but... But a long, 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 maybe long, a billion. long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, the things that are in Shark Bay, or I forget what they're called. Stroma- stromatolites. Yeah. Yep. I want to say stromatolites, but then I think of stalactites and stalagmites and then get confused. But they're, they're what we consider the oldest living thing. And they're technically, I think, a bacteria, but also part... Algae or okay, so so so, I guess what you're saying is but things we think of as plants like moss, and yeah, liverworts. So when 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 you start going, okay, this is this is I look at it, I see a plant, yeah, yeah, and okay. you see the cells and the the things joined up that make it look like, and also the little rhizomes, which are equivalent equivalent of stems later on, that anchor it to the rocks and feed the plant. We see them about four hundred and seventy million years ago. Okay, so um, so they they come onto the land. Yep. Um, they start photosynthesizing. Start, yeah. So that, so how do they how do they what are the adaptations that allow them to 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 I guess live out of water. live out of water. Well, one thing was so this is one thing that a lot of people don't realize that plants still have moving parts up until the flowering part, plants. So before that. Every plant, like including the gym triffids. Sperm. No, like, no. <laughs> like sperm. They all okay. have moving, swimming sperm. So they need the water for the sperm to swim to the female egg to fertilize it to start the next generation. Without water, you're not going to get another moss. It might, cl- it might grow clonally, so it'll just recreate itself again and again, but you won't get that genetic recreation to help it evolve along the lineage. And so... Without having the water, um, the mosses and the liverworts and the hornworts wouldn't have ex- existed. But they overcame the need to live under the water the whole time. And to do that, they had the rhizomes that they evolved, and they also thickened up their cells a bit. They also form um, cells that help exchange the um, products that they make, like oxygen, from the carbon that they sucked up. So without those little... They're not stomata, but they're stomata-like structures. 
they wouldn't have been able to get onto the land. The other thing is that they started adapting to take out nutrients from things like rocks or soil. Because there was no soil, was there? No, yeah, not really. Not so, really. So, so they started breaking down rocks into soil. So deer plants, firstly, thanks for the oxygen, um, but also um, thanks for the soil. Yeah. And you would think also that some of the lichen, which are technically fungi, they would have been breaking down the rocks too. So you had completely complete other lineage, which are the fungi, they would have been breaking down some of the rocks. Because, the, yeah, I mean, they're, they're a completely different thing again, yeah. aren't they? So you, the, we, we often, you often see, see plant books that have fungi in them. Because we're nice. So, is, that, is that like you, you're, you're inclusive? Yeah. Be, well, fungi are a complete, complete, complete different lineage kingdom of their own. on the tree of life. And they're more closely related to animals than plants. But in the past, they've been considered plants or plant-like. And so we had a special vote in 2011 to include the fungi people in the plant taxonomy laws. <laughs> you had a so special vote. We did. <laughs> so who gets to vote? I didn't. I wasn't asked to vote. So if you go to the International Botanical Congress, which is held every seven years, it's like the botan- well, the Olympics of botany, and the one I went to was in Melbourne. Um, you get a ticket to vote in the nomenclature section the week before. So. Because I was a postdoc, I went along and voted. Okay. Oh, so it's very proper. So you you voted in favour? Uh, I think I did. You think you did? The, this, the Melbourne <laughs> one, the, the most important thing was when we voted on whether Australia kept Acacia, the genus name, or not. Although another one was whether we used Latin names to describe plants or whether we could use English names and, or English instead. So some pretty big decisions get made at the... You, you haven't lived until you've seen two botanical nerds argue over So these do, does, do these arguments get really quite passionate? Yeah, they do. And the other thing is, the people are we, are like, are we talking fisticuffs, brawls, or well, people just well, names, throwing names with and accents at each other? But yeah, you haven't lived until you've seen grown men hold a book and refer to the book as if it's a person. They're like their best friend. Like the code won't be happy if we make these changes. <laughs> so you don't know anything about the code. I know the code better than you do. It's a fascinating insight, <laughs> isn't it, into uh, a side of the academic like world a cult. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, well, I suppose in a way but 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 it is, but, but, but we do and we forget that 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 scientists are people and you you become so i guess ingrained into it's, the universe well, yeah, and, you and more than that it's there not all the botanists go to this thing it's like the subcommittee it's like the people who like going on committees and arguing about things yeah they go to so these things it code. happens every 7 years and then they're the ones that come up with the code and then the code for the next seven years is given the name of where the place. So for seven years, it was the Melbourne code. Then it was held in China. The next one's next year in Madrid. So it'll become the Madrid code. The same thing happens with animals. Okay. Yeah. All right. But not with, with fossils, as far as I know. So we're, 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 we've got these plants that are on land. Yep. And there are th- possibly things that look like things that we would look at and go, oh, I recognize that. Pretty much. Um. What what happens next? Because plants started getting bigger, yeah. didn't they? So how was as that they, possible? As they adapted to living out of the water a bit better, they become bigger and develop more structures in their leaves or leaf-like structures to then move water around the plant. Because if you think of what a big gum tree does, it has to get water from the bottom of the... from where it is and 90 metres up, get it to the leaves. So you have to develop all these vascular bundles and chemicals inside those cells to move that water all the way up so as plants became more complicated they became better at moving water and conserving water as well and then became more complicated in the way they reproduce and the way they attract things to help them reproduce so after the mosses and liverworts and hornworts the next living lineage that we have at least are the lycophytes which are commonly known as tassel ferns so so what if I was looking at one, what would it look like? It's do you know what a tassel fern looks like? Or we have things called selaginella. So a lot of them which is called club moss. Yep. I'm gonna get one up on a computer screen so you know what I'm talking about. They look like mossy kind of things, but they're really large and they they My computer's just running a little slow. There you go. 
Okay, and we'll put links to all of yeah. these things in, in the in the podcast notes. So for okay. those of you in Adelaide, if you go into the Shade House in the Adelaide Botanic Garden, there's a bunch of tassel ferns on display, and also in the conservatory. Um, yep. But every Botanic Gardens will have one. So tassel ferns, yep. that's the... Yeah, so and, what? and they're, they're bigger. So, so what... Do they, what did they do that was different? One thing they did, and this is where there's a big line between the mosses, liverworts and hornworts and every other plant that's still alive, is that in mosses, liverworts and hornworts, they, their main stage of life only has one set of chromosomes. So you and I have two sets of chromosomes in our cells. When the lycophytes evolved, they did a complete switcheroo and the main life cycle became two sets of chromosomes. So by doing that, you can readjust your, your genetic structure and start making yourself look more different. And and so because when you when you have there's a greater chance of error in reproduction, isn't there? Yep. If you've got two, and, and we see that with with with, the, with animal evolution. Yeah, and there's a greater chance of wiping yourself out if your main life stage is just one set of chromosome, because you need to mix your cells with something else and get it over there, which and they have sperm that swims, so that's banking on a lot of things happening like rain yep that and that's why this is the reason why you find mosses and liverworts in wet places because they try and stick to the really wet places it's only some that you find in the deserts but they must have evolved years and years millions and millions of years later okay so so we've got these we, we, we've now got plants that have two sets of yep. chromosomes so how do they and they're different because we look at things like ferns yep that use spores. Yep. And, and they we, use spores as well. So these things use spores as well. Um, but then there are other ways of doing that. So so spores underneath a fern, the wind blows and the thing does its thing and they all live happily ever after. Um, but <laughs> is that is that right? <laughs> um, it's a bit more complex so than that well, though, isn't it? There's you're probably thinking of you're gonna talk about pollen soon, but the yeah. difference between spores and pollen is that spores are the equivalent of a seed. And so mosses, liverworts, hornworts, lycophytes, um, and ferns all form spores. And from that spore, a new plant grows out. But the spores also look like pollen. But the pollen is just the male part. And so the, the gymnosperms, which are commonly known as pine trees or conifers, and all the angiosperms have pollen, but that only has the male part in it. So that's the difference. But plant doesn't grow out of a pollen, grows out of a spore. Grows out of a spore. Yep. Okay. Okay. So again, it's a switcheroo between ferns to gymnosperms is when that happens. Okay, and that's another step. And that yeah, and that process. opens up that opens up the gymnosperms and then the angiosperms to exploring new land because now you don't rely on tiny little thing to um you, you're not relying on the, the swimming sperm. You can rely on the wind or animals to transfer your male part to another part. So you can fly it over the water or over land. You can have a bird or, or an insect. So, so gymnosperm, if I'm looking at a gymnosperm, what yep. am I looking at? Uh, you're looking at a pine tree, or but you can, it's not just pine trees. So cycads are also gymnosperms. Yep. So it's Latin for naked seed. So anything with a pine cone will be a gymnosperm. Yep. Anything... Uh, so what else? Podocarpus, which has fleshy fruit. That's a native Australian gymnosperm, but um, it's also in a bunch of other countries. Yep, and angiosperm, if I'm looking at one of them. Angiosperm will always have flowers. It's a flower. And that's so... the last divergence between what we have alive at the moment. So in between all of them, and this is not my specialty, but there's a bunch of other plant lineages that had lots of different other characters that have gone extinct. And so the, we have all these missing steps. And that's where Darwin pointed out that was these weird steps that you go gymnosperms, flowering plants. What was in between? What was in between? So and, some of them are extinct. And, and, and as with the animal fossil record, the fossil record is always going to be incomplete. Yeah. But um, also think of what went extinct when we had the Cretaceous and the, the massive... Um, asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs probably wiped out most of their food as well which were probably more gymnosperm like than angiosperm and it was that point where the angiosperms took over 
So flowers turn up yep. um, and they convince insects, hey, I've got some stuff for you yep. if you do this thing for me. Yep. Well, and I, I think there's not what's in it for me. It's more, here's some stuff and then I'll trick you into taking it to somewhere else. Yeah. But that also happens in the gymnosperms because the cycads do that. And they heat up their cones at night and they get really, really warm and that attracts weevils in. This was one of my friend's PhD subject. I did not know this. Yeah. So it, the, and you have male and female cones. So the male cone heats up and might be four or five degrees warmer than the outside temperature. The weevils see it, they come in, then they get covered in, in pollen. And at the same time, um, the male cone will release something that makes the weevils want to go away. The female cone will make something that makes the weevils want to go to it and they take the pollen over and pollinate the plant. I'm so I'm in awe of our... It's not just the um, angiosperms that do that. I've got some pictures somewhere. Overlords. Yeah. Um, okay, so plants haven't been around. And it, it's really hard for us to visualise, isn't it? To imagine, because we're so used to seeing plants in our gardens. We're so used to going to, you know, Valentine's Day, giving people yeah. flowers. Like if you if, yeah. if you were giving somebody something on Valentine's Day two hundred million years ago, what then, would you give them? A pile of moss? No, there'd be cycads around and and okay. burn trees. So we had Lots bigger of cool things. It was a glossy opterus, I think it is. That was around back then. So a lot of the lineages that are now kind of small were trees once upon a time, and then. As the androsperms came to dominate, they either weren't extinct before that happened, and the androsperms filled a spot, or the androsperms made them go extinct. So 200 years ago, you wouldn't be giving anyone flowers because our first flower was probably around 150, 140 million years ago. But again, that's only is based on the pollen that we can find that would back that up, and also the macro fossils that we find that would back that up. So if we find older fossils, we'll change our mind about how old flowering plants are. All right, we've got we've got about just under two and a half minutes to go. Oh, wow. We're here in Australia. Um, gum trees, oldest fossils of eucalypts are actually from South America. Yes. So the smell of Australia is the smell of the gum tree. How did they become so dominant in this place? In East Coast Australia or Australia? In, in Australia, I suppose, in general. So, a... we think, well, the oldest fossil that we know of is in South America, in Patagonia. And there may be older ones in Australia, but we can't date them properly because the way they preserve is completely different to the way they preserve in South America. They probably just sit, sat there minding their own business, waiting for the right time. And it was just dumb luck that Australia broke away from Gondwana, drifted north, and became warmer and warmer and drier. As that happened, the eucalypts had things that they were adapted for those climates, like thick leaves and the ability to regenerate from fire. And so... And to make fires worse. Yeah. So they dump all their... They make their own pyre, I say. They make their like, own... F yeah, Jim Morrison. Funeral pyre. And, yeah. and, and <laughs> they, they, the, a fire happens, the fire becomes worse. Yep. Or and then they burn all their competition, but they have the ability to grow back as a tree because they have epicormic buds hidden. So epicormic, deep. what does that mean? Epicormic buds are, are buds that eucalypts use to regenerate after fire and they're buried deep within the bark. So you might burn the outside of the tree, but the inside is still alive. They grow back these big new leaves. Instead of growing as a seedling, you're growing back as a tree, whereas all your competition's starting out as a baby again. And so they have 10 years to get to a tree, uh, an adult tree to make the flowers, to make the pollen, to try and make a new generation, whereas the eucalypts can do it within one or two years. So they are assassinating their competition. Yeah, burning, burning them out. The, like Game of Thrones, like Dracarys yeah. bellowing across the universe. That is... And one of my studies that I did suggests that the East Coast eucalypts are probably about 5 million years old, if that. So most of the species are younger than that, if our fossil calibrations are right. And so if these things may change, but it depends on what you have at the time. Thank you, Dr. Andrew Thornhill. We are out of time. That has been fabulous. Thank you. It's
time to spread some paleo jam.